Hey guys, it's Miss Batty here, back with our lesson four in our series on populations and resources. As I mentioned last time, what we're going to do today is a hands-on investigation to collect some evidence to help us answer our question about the increasing size of the moon jelly populations. What you're going to need today is a pencil or pen and some paper to take down your ideas. If you have the packet pages available for this lesson, you can go ahead and get those out right now. If you would like to do the investigation with me today, what you're going to need is some yeast, some sugar, some warm water and cups, and some different measuring spoons and measuring cups. If you don't have these supplies, no worries. You're gonna be able to follow along with me as I do the investigation today. Let's get started. We ended last time with realizing that the moon jelly population was definitely increasing in size based on the population samples that we had looked at. We know that this means the number of births in the moon jelly population must be larger than the number of deaths in the time where it is increasing. I surveyed my students to see what their ideas are about why this might be occurring. Why are all of a sudden the number of births greater than the number of deaths in the moon jelly population? Here are some of their ideas. The majority of students were thinking that the number of births increased and the death stayed the same. Students were thinking that the number of deaths actually was decreasing and the births were staying the same. And some students were thinking that actually both of these things were occurring, that the number of births were increasing and the number of deaths were decreasing. A couple of my students had some other ideas that we can talk about as we continue through this lesson. Because the majority of my students were thinking that the number of births was causing this change, that they were increasing, this is where we're going to start our investigations. We need to collect evidence about why there might be changes in the number of births in a population and whether this is occurring actually in our moon jelly populations that we are studying. Our focus question for this portion of the unit is, what could have caused the births to increase in the moon jelly population? What causes changes to the birth rate in a population? What we're talking about here is the process of reproduction. Reproduction is the process of creating offspring or the process of having new births in a population. Over here, we can see some new tadpoles about to hatch, meaning that births are about to occur. We are going to be looking into reproduction today and thinking about what might affect an organism's ability to reproduce or the ability to increase or decrease the number of births that they're having. I want you to pause the video for a moment and think about what your thoughts might be. What might cause an organism to reproduce more or less in a certain period of time? Let's take a second to think about this. All right. Hopefully you got a moment to talk with a friend or family member and you've thought about your ideas. What can cause these changes in the number of births in a population? Well, reproduction is an action, right? Just like breathing, walking, talking, it probably requires the same thing that allows us to do things each day, which is energy. So that's where we're going to start our investigations today. Energy comes from something called energy storage molecules, a molecule that organisms can use to release energy in order to survive. Now you might have seen some of these different types of energy storage molecules. There are different kinds such as starch, glucose, or fats. All of these different energy storage molecules 
are broken down by the body and used to release this energy for us to be able to do all of the things that we do. We are going to think about how could energy affect reproduction? In a moment, we are going to do an investigation with yeast. Our goal here is to find out if the differences in the amount of energy storage molecules that we give the yeast has an effect on how much the yeast can reproduce. For our yeast investigation, you are going to need yeast, sugar, three cups, cup A, B, and C. You'll need a spoon to measure out the yeast and the sugar, and you also will need some warm water. Now, I didn't have all of these materials like in the picture below, but I was able to make up some materials myself at home. So what I was able to find around my house was three small bowls um, that I have labeled as A, B, and C for the three different cups that we're gonna be using. I also was able to get some sugar um, packets and able to get some yeast at the store. And then I have a jug of warm water uh, for me to be able to use. Now, I didn't have a graduated cylinder to measure out exactly 40 milliliters. So instead, I am going to use a quarter of a cup, which is about the same amount. You also are going to need to measure out a tablespoon and a teaspoon for this experiment. So if you have all of these materials around the house, then you can go ahead and pause the video in just a moment and do the yeast experiment just as this instruction setup tells you. Everybody though, I would like to pause the video in a moment, even if you are going to follow along with the experiment with me, to think about what your hypothesis might be. What is your prediction about what will occur in each cup? Remember in cup A, there is going to be no energy storage molecules. In cup B, there is going to be a pinch of energy storage molecules or sugar. And in cup C, there is going to be a teaspoon of energy storage molecules known as sugar. If you're ready, pause the video, share your hypothesis with a family member or friend, and if you are ready to do the experiment yourself, skip over this next part while we get started together. So as I mentioned, the first thing that I'm going to do is get my sugar set up. Now this is my manipulated variable because I am changing the amount of energy that I'm giving to each of the yeast in the three containers. Now in cup A, which I have labeled on the bottom, I'm gonna put no sugar. In cup B, I am going to put a pinch. And in cup C, I am going to put a teaspoon of sugar um, in this third cup. The next thing I'm going to do is add the yeast. Now this is actually going to be a, a controlled variable because I'm going to put the same amount of yeast in each of my containers. I'm not trying to change the amount of yeast. Oops, got that spilled everywhere. That's why it's important to have it in a, a nice area to do this in. Um, but my yeast, I'm gonna put a tablespoon of yeast into each of uh, the cups. And I wanna make sure I have the same amount in each um, because the goal here is not to change the amount of yeast the amount of energy storage molecules. And so again, I'm adding a tablespoon in cup B uh, right now. And finally, a tablespoon um, into our cup C. Now the other controlled variable is going to be the amount of warm water that I put into each cup. And like I said, it should be about 40 milliliters. Um, which is just a little under a quarter of a cup. So I'm gonna add the water next. Um, and again, it's really important. I have the same amount of water. Uh, it's a controlled variable. So we want to make sure it's the same in each of the cups. 
And then finally, what I'm gonna do is give each cup a good little stir, make sure everything is mixed, starting um, here. It'd be great to use different spoons in each cup to make sure there's no cross-contamination, um, making sure sugar is not getting into cup A when it's not supposed to have sugar. Mix that all up. So we're going to put these aside in just a moment uh, because it'll take a little bit for our yeast to be able to interact with the sugar that we've added. Um, and so while we do this, I'm going to take a look in the digital model um, to see what we're observing about reproduction. So if you have the digital model available to you, you can go ahead and pause the video and do this yourself, but if not, feel free to follow along with me. So as I mentioned, while we wait for our results, I'm gonna get into the digital model and just make some observations about what I am noticing when these different organisms are reproducing. You're gonna to want to use the three populations digital model uh, with energy storage molecules, which is in the center. So if you have access, go ahead and pause uh, see if you can work with someone and, and talk about what you're observing. If not, follow along with me. So here I have the digital model um, and I'm gonna just reset it and start it again. And remember that we are looking into understanding a little bit more about reproduction. So if you recall, we can actually track which organisms are reproducing um, and make some observations about them. So the first thing I notice is that a lot of the green leaves are lit up, um, meaning that they look like they are reproducing quite often. We see that the fur bulls and the wee bugs are lighting up and, and, and then turning off, but it seems like the green leaves are constantly reproducing. So let's start with them and take a look. Interesting. So. I noticed that labeled here, it says that these ESMs or the energy storage molecules are decreasing during this time of reproduction. I also noticed that the green leaf was reproducing, it stopped and then started reproducing again. That's really interesting. Let's click off, zoom back out again um, and see if we can look at something else. So, oh, interesting. Um, hold on, I clicked the wrong thing. So let's get in here. So these guys are reproducing and it looks like something that's a little different, if you notice, was the, the wee bugs seem to have met up when they are reproducing. Whereas the green leaves, if you notice, they were all lit up individually, which is kind of interesting to, to think about. Um, let's take a look, see if we can find any. Oh, here's a furball. So similar again, I'm not sure, and I'll, I'll pause that for just a moment, but when those furballs were reproducing, they had met up as well. And I wanna see, here we're gonna have a furball, we'll click on it. Um, and again, yeah, I see these are reproducing, they've met up. And again, I'm seeing this, this energy storage molecule decreasing. So it seems like they've got these little tanks of energy underneath, um, and they are using that energy when they are reproducing, which is interesting. Um, so let's try one more, see if we can find some wee bugs. Here we go. They go off and on so quickly. Oh no, that one died of old age. Well, that's all right. I'm gonna pause here um, because it seems like it's confirming what we were thinking that these organisms are using energy to be able to reproduce. So in a moment, we're gonna get back to our investigation and see how different amounts of energy affect the ability of the yeast to reproduce. All right, you guys, so I just came back from making my observations in the digital model, and I think it's time now to take a look at our evidence. 
So this is cup A uh, right here, and it doesn't really look that different to me. There's water in it, um, the yeast mixed together, but I didn't really observe any changes in cup A. Now cup B, if we compare it to, to cup A, you might notice that it is slightly more in there. It looks like the level on cup B has increased slightly over time. But the real difference that I am seeing is in cup C. This container, and we can take a look um, in this way, this is cup A and B, ah, but seeing cup A versus cup C I think is really important. Cup A has barely changed while cup C almost is full to the top now. Um, and so that is really interesting. It seems like the yeast has really grown and expanded in that cup C where I had most of the sugar. Now, it's important to know that actually what we just observed is not because the yeast is actually larger um, because it's reproducing. The yeast is actually producing bubbles, which is causing the changes in the levels in the cups. The bubbles are carbon dioxide, and this occurs from a process uh, called cellular respiration that we're gonna talk about in our matter and energy unit in, in our next unit. Um, and this occurs when the yeast and other organisms are releasing energy from the energy storage molecules. So we know that these yeast are using the energy, and when they get more of it, they are using more of it as well. As we saw in the digital model, it requires that energy to reproduce. And so we can say that the yeast that had more energy storage molecules was increasing in size more. Let's take a look at a video right now uh, to think about and test to see if another organism also seems to be giving us similar observations. We are gonna watch a video in a moment of some cricket reproduction. And again, we are going to give the crickets different amounts of sugar or energy storage molecules and think about whether or not it is affecting the amount of reproduction. Enjoy. We're going to do an experiment to investigate how cricket reproduction is affected by the amount of sugar crickets eat. Sugar is a type of energy storage molecule. Crickets and other organisms can use sugar to release energy. They need to release energy to move around, avoid predators, and reproduce. Crickets reproduce by laying eggs. In our experiment, we're going to examine two groups of crickets, group A and group B. We'll give these two groups different amounts of sugar in their food and see how that affects their reproduction. We'll give group A food that's low in sugar. Group B will get food that's high in sugar. Let's leave the crickets and check back in four hours to see what happens. Four hours have gone by. Let's observe our results. Now we can see how much each group reproduced by counting how many eggs they laid. Group A, the group that received less sugar, laid 10 eggs. Group B, the group that received more sugar, laid 50 eggs. The group that got more sugar, group B, reproduced more. This is evidence that when more energy storage molecules are available, organisms can reproduce more. Interesting. So it seems like this pattern that we're noticing in our yeast investigation is also replicated with the cricket reproduction. 
a lot of evidence that we collected today. I want us to kind of think about it over the next couple of days and come back to this with a fresh set of eyes in our next lesson. In our next lesson, we are going to read an article and summarize what all of this evidence is telling us about what could be affecting the number of births in a population. See you next time.